Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Alps podcast. We're still at the Alps Conference uh, 2023 in Geneva. It's day one, and we are together. I'm not alone. I'm uh, Michael, and uh, this is Marco. Hi, Marco. Hello. Hello, everyone. Having fun so far at the conference? Great insights, and uh, I learned a lot thanks to Abigail. We are just welcoming now. Yes, we are with Abigail. Abigail, hello. Thank you. I'm just going to describe you, and then you can uh, jump along and describe better. Abigail <laughs> Calder, uh, you are a PhD candidate at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, where you research a uh, project on the effect of LSD on neuroplasticity in healthy people. So... Did I say it right? Yes, or that was more perfect. To say? That was, I mean, <laughs> how long do you have? We also like to study adverse effects and effects of psychedelics on well-being and how to measure psychedelic effects and a few other little things as well. How long have you been working on the field and why this field? Mm, I've been a PhD candidate for almost three years now, and I've been more or less interested in the field for about five years. Yeah. Um, and I kind of discovered it during my master's degree. I studied in Germany, and uh, I've always been interested in altered states and why the brain does the weird things that it does in altered states. But for some reason, it just wasn't on my radar that you could induce them in the lab with a drug. And at some point while I was doing my neuroscience master's, I came across uh, research from Roland Griffiths at Johns Hopkins, and just a light bulb went on, and that was it, really. Great. Mm -hmm. And why stopping at University of Fribourg in Switzerland? Mm, that was actually a, a really, really lucky break. So I knew I wanted to study psychedelics, and... Most PhD positions in this field are not advertised, so you just have to write people, reach out to people until you get lucky and somebody has a position for you and likes you enough to hire you. And I wrote tons of people and uh, Gregor Hasler. Yes, uh, which we know well at Alps huh? yes. because he's been there uh, for quite some time. Yes, and he also gave a talk on adverse effects. So, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I happened to write to him because I saw he'd done some ketamine research and he happened to write back saying, yeah, I thought about doing some LSD research. And so I wrote back saying, can I join? And that was that, really. Mm. Right. So we're here to speak about your talk at, at day one of the Alps conference, which is on the uh, adverse effect of, of psychedelics. And it's true, it's always a hot topic to, uh, to discuss uh, at, a, at a psychedelic conference, but I think uh, it's a good topic to discuss. So can you explain a bit what are the main adverse effects of psychedelics? Mm. Yeah, so I really focused on the adverse effects that cause major problems for people when they happen. So not the most typical things like headaches or nausea or a little bit of anxiety, um, but really when people feel like they're struggling with psychedelic adverse effects sometimes for a while. Um, unfortunately, sometimes people have, par you know, particularly after they have really frightening psychedelic experiences that are not supported very well, some s minority of people struggles with that for a while afterward. They might develop symptoms like anxiety or perceptual difficulties, derealization, uh, and a few other things as well. So that's what I came here to talk about, just to kind of remind people that this can happen, that we need to do more research on how to prevent it and how to stop small problems from becoming big ones if we see them coming, and how to help people who really are in the throes of difficulties after a psychedelic trip. That's very interesting. I had a question on probability. Mm. What's the percentage of probability? Do we have a percentage uh, of knowing uh, when a person can have a bad trip? Mm. So we have a few different percentages, and we can try and do the math. Um, there was a study from 2016 that interviewed people who had a challenging experience with psilocybin. They found that about 10% of those people had some psychological difficulties lasting more than a year after that. About one in four had difficulties lasting more than a week. Uh, about 7% ended up seeking professional help for their difficulties. So those are some numbers. And this was after a challenging or frightening psilocybin mm -hmm. experience. So then you have to know what's the likelihood of having a frightening psychedelic yes. experience. Do we have those uh, those numbers? It or? really depends on the setting. So in a controlled setting, um, in, a, in a clinical trial, for example, it's somewhere between 2 and 5%-ish. Well, which yeah. is considered quite low. It's qu quite okay. low, yeah. And those are lots of different times of experiences, and oftentimes they resolve pretty well. I think how an experience like that ends actually matters a lot. Um, I touched on this in the talk where the longer uh, a challenging experience lasts, the longer the frightening portion lasts, the more likely it is to cause problems. And I think that's because 
when they don't last as long, it's because they resolve into something mm -hmm. positive or, or at least into something not so horrible. And for unsupervised, uh, do we have any data? This is really hard to say. Actually, in the study that I'm doing now with the, the online study, we're trying to get some data on this. And so far, uh, three out of 76 people said that they had a trip that was more negative than positive. So it's still pretty low. Um, that sample is, of course, self-selecting. Mm -hmm. um, so this is people who wanted to take part in a psychedelic study and who probably are relatively well informed about the effects. And this is also a sample of people who have done psychedelics at least once before. Um, but, you know, something in the ballpark of 5%, uh, you could say. During your conference, you showed us a few comparisons between drugs and the, the adverse effects uh, we would expect from each of these drugs. Uh, after your experience, would you say that there is a least risky drug mm, or it, it is always depending on the setup? I think it depends a lot more on the setting than mm. on the drug. Um, but in the data so far, I'm not seeing any big differences between, for example, LSD and psilocybin. I didn't have a lot of people yet who took ayahuasca and DMT, so I can't say anything about that yet. And MDMA seems to cause at least a different constellation of effects. So people report more adverse effects in the week after MDMA than in the week after LSD or psilocybin. Frankly, some of these people probably uh, had contaminated drugs because we're studying naturalistic use. And we try to estimate the drug purity, but it's never going to be perfect. But even in clinical trials, you sometimes see a little bit of a come down effect with MDMA. Um, Overall, I wouldn't say that I feel confident blaming one psychedelic for more adverse effects than any of the others at this point, though. And can you explain uh, the, the bad effects that, uh, that some have and uh, wh what they are, mm. uh, actually, depending on which, uh, which substance people take? Yeah, so the typical thing with MDMA, um, less so with pure MDMA, but it can still happen, is that in the week after the experience, uh, people can feel tired and a little bit depressed. Uh, it usually goes away, and I think if you warn people about it, they know it's not real, they know that it will go away, and it doesn't usually end up causing lasting problems. So that's the kind of unique thing about MDMA. Uh, and as far as the other psychedelics, I think with them you're more likely to see some of these, uh, what you might call reality-bending adverse effects, so things like derealization or um, people feeling like they have trouble trusting their own thinking, people feeling like their assumptions about reality have been violated, and ending up in some kind of uh, spiritual crisis is a word some people use for that. Very interesting. Um, so wh what, when you uh, s research this field and, and you uh, arrive to those conclusions, what, what would be the next step knowing this? What, what, wh how, how would you uh, use the, uh, w in what you research? Yeah, so the next step is how do we prevent these things from happening? Or to put it another way, how do we make sure... Uh, psychedelic healing is no more painful than it absolutely has to be because mm. sometimes it's not fun, but in, in the end it's beneficial. Um, and I think one of the most important things is something that we are actually already pretty good at in this field, and that's preventing these really frightening traumatic trips. Um, you really don't see these so often in controlled settings, although I also wouldn't get too complacent and say we're completely immune mm. to it. You know, whenever I'm supervising an LSD session, it's, it's always in the back of my mind that this could happen and that... Uh, we need to make sure that we don't get anywhere near that. Um, but we pretty much know how to prevent bad trips and how to create a good setting where people at least feel safe and supportive. And then even if they do have a difficult hour or two on LSD, it usually ends well. Um, so that's number one, is that we prevent some of these major risk factors. And some of the other risk factors that came up um, in our research are things like younger age mm. or having a, a previous diagnosis of anxiety or depression. You know, it could be that people who have some of these risk factors may need more support than others. Um, or maybe they need to be a little more cautious with psychedelics. Than other Can we people. explain younger age? Does it come from the brain plasticity or something like this? Or? It could be that. It could also be actually an indirect thing um, and an effect of how younger people tend to take psychedelics. Maybe they are a little bit more into risky behavior or reckless behavior. This we can't differentiate in the data yet, um, mm. but I hope we will be able to. Because I know as uh, MDMA and psilocybin slowly move toward the approval process, there are going to be clinical trials in younger people, you know, younger 20s, certainly, and even older teenagers. I know that people are planning this. I think it'll be really important for them to watch out for uh, particularly perceptual side effects just to make sure there's not an elevated risk in that group, because at least in naturalistic psychedelic use, it seems like there might be. Mm -hmm. 
back to the topic of your conference and uh, the adverse effects, uh, actually, I was asking to myself if it could be possible to distinguish an hallucination from an insight. Mm. Mm. How is it possible to distinguish both of them? Yeah, well, usually a hallucination refers to perception. So if you have an auditory hallucination, you hear something that's not there. And if it's a true hallucination, you don't know it's not real. Mm -hmm. Or if you see something that's not there, that's a visual, visual hallucination, right? And hallucination is not usually a word that's applied to insight or to thoughts. Mm. If someone is thinking something's not real, you'd usually call that a delusion. Mm. Problem is, with some of these psychedelic insights, they're so personal, you can't necessarily test whether it'll be real or not. And to some degree, the person has to know that for themselves. But sometimes what you notice is that people will have almost contradictory insights. Um, and you just have to think, you know, those can't both be true. I, I know of one example where somebody uh, took LSD and they had the insight that some of the stuff that happened to them as a kid with their family was not important and they should just let it go. And then a year later, they took LSD again, and they had the insight that they really needed to work through some of that stuff. And it's like, well, which one is it? You know, those can't both be true, probably not in that order anyway. Um, and so sometimes people can have this feeling that something's important, true, or meaningful, and I don't know if I would always trust it, you know? And one of the first signs that somebody is getting high on LSD is that feeling without content. Sometimes people just have the feeling that something important is happening. They don't yet know what. But that means that that kind of hallucination is possible. And what do people need to do? Wait, because they don't need to act on this insight or this hallucination. What's the, the, what, what do they need to do then when yeah, this happens? We advise people to not make any major life decisions <laughs> for about two weeks after taking LSD. <laughs> wait. Um, yeah, wait and judge for yourself once you're back in a normal state of mind. And, you know, sometimes the next day and the next week you think about that insight again and it still makes a lot of sense. And then sometimes you're not so sure. Um, so it's something people have to judge for themselves, and hopefully it's something that they can also discuss with the people around them, whether it's therapists or family or whoever. I have one very last personal question. Uh, reviewing your biography, I noted that psychedelics could even influence people's values. And I'm working as a marketer on the marketing field and actually changing people's values. This is something marketing or even education failed uh, trying to do this. How can psychedelics influence these uh, personal values? Mm. Well, what I see generally is that people, after a psychedelic tip, trip, sometimes feel closer to the values they already have. Mm. It's likely, hopefully not the case, that somebody else could use psychedelics to change my values or your values. I mean, anybody who would even try that, I would definitely question their motives. I... I hope and think psychedelics can't really be used that way successfully. But what they seem to be able to do is to bring people a little closer to the, the deeper values they already have, the, the more long-term values they already have. Thank you. Any additional things you want to tell us uh, before we, uh, we close this uh, discussion? Just thank you for the invitation. This was Great. Nice. We thank you. And where can we learn more about your work? Yeah, so I work at the University of Fribourg. Um, we do have a website. Uh, if you Google Gregor Hasler Psychedelics Lab, you will find it. I'm also on Twitter at Neuro Calder. And I think I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't look at it very often. <laughs> and anyway, uh, uh, we, we can find it about uh, your, uh, your, um, your conference on the YouTube channel of Alps. And you tap uh, Alps Conference or you go on Alps Point Foundation and you will find everything there. And we will, of course, post everything in uh, the, the podcast itself. So Abigail, thank you very much thank for you. this super high level conference, which was really insightful and for all the work you're doing conference was even better than this interview <laughs> so we really <laughs> wish you just to have a look at this conference damn i'm going downhill <laughs> <laughs> right. thank you thanks thank again you. goodbye <laughs>